All right, should I begin? Okay, I think uh, it, we're about to start and I'm very happy to uh, start our new seminar. Um, uh, and uh, the title of, um, and today's speaker is Professor uh, Lois Hirsch Kaufman from the University of Illinois in Chicago. And he will tell us about diagrammatic algebra state sums and relationship uh, of graph theory and virtual null theory. So let's welcome. Thank you very much, Vasily. I'm pleased to be able to start your new seminar. Um, I'm going to be, uh, we, another uh, title for this talk could be called Travels with Epsilon where epsilon is the epsilon tensor. Epsilon i, j, k is equal to one or minus one or zero. And i, j, and k equals one, two, three, one, three, two, and so on, three indices. So for example, epsilon one, two, three is equal to one. Epsilon one, three, two is equal to a minus one. Epsilon one, one, two is equal to zero. That should suffice for you to understand how this works. Epsilon of sigma is equal to the sine of sigma when sigma belongs to the symmetric group on three letters and epsilon of sigma is equal to zero if sigma has a repetition. Whoops. Um, sorry, uh, I don't know what happened there, repetition. So is that clear and you can you can um, read my my screen and everything? Yes. So um, I'm I'm introducing this now because we'll see that it, this is an appropriate title for the talk. Uh, but I thought I would introduce this right now. I, I also want to remind you of certain lore about the three index epsilon. Uh, uh, you can you hear me? Could you please, uh, uh, I am English. sorry, but I'm getting a lot of noise from you. I will not talk over your talking. Excuse are me, you I'm muted? Very sorry. Are you muted? If you're not muted, I won't continue. Can you hear me? Please affirm that you can hear me. Excuse me, your screen sharing has stopped. Could you please do it again? I'm sorry. I I don't know what you're saying. The sound is garbled. And if you're talking, I can't talk. Uh, can you please uh, share your screen again? Uh, we can't see your screen so far. I thought there was something wrong. Now, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. Now, did have you read the screen this far, or you never saw my screen? You can see the screen now. Can you hear me? I do not know if you can hear me. No, I can't hear you. Uh, I can hear, hear you. you fine. We can hear you fine. All we right. I'll you. assume you can. I don't want to go on talking and not have not know whether you can hear me or not. So, as I said, the the talk could be titled "Travels with Epsilon," where the epsilon is the three index tensor, um, one minus one or zero. And of course, there are many interpretations of this tensor. 
One of them diagrammatically I will be using like this. I'll use a diagram with three indices on it. And this diagram will mean exactly epsilon i, j, k. And then sometimes we will multiply by the square root of minus 1. Sometimes, but for right now, I won't do that, all right? So I'm telling you some lore about the epsilon for a little while. Um, and uh, that's one. Um, another fact that you know about the epsilon is that if M is a three by three matrix, then the determinant of M is equal to the sum over i, j, and k of epsilon i, j, k, m1 i, m2 j, m3 k. And you can think of this as summing over all choices of these indices because after all, the ones we're interested in for the determinant are the ones where this is non-zero, and then it's the sign of the permutation. Um, so this is the way it comes about for a determinant. Um, and another fact about the epsilon that I will include on this slide is that if you have V and W are vectors in R3, then the vector cross product of V and W in the kth place is equal to the sum on I and J of epsilon I, J, K v i multiplied by v j w j where those are the coordinates of the vectors so another way of putting that in terms of these diagrammatics is that if you think of the index of the vector as a line coming down from it then this is equal to the cross product of those two vectors, all right? So those are some facts about the epsilon. This is just, this one is just saying this using the diagram. And now let's continue with this. We're going to talk about the epsilon for a few minutes. Um, okay. Here is a very nice identity about the epsilon that I like to write diagrammatically. And it is understood, some things have to be understood here, but I'll leave the identity in its abstract form and we'll take another copy of it for uh, festooning it with some indices. All right, so here, this identity, uh, in order to understand what I mean by this identity, you need to know what I mean by a little line segment. A little line segment is an identity transformation. This is delta i j where this is equal to one when i is equal to j and zero 
if i is not equal to j. And so this says that the product of two epsilons, we could take epsilon i j, have a k here, and, and let's consider L and M, but let's just consider the following case. Uh, well, um, it says it for general indices, but let's put numbers in here, and then that with the, with the, what it means will become completely obvious to you, in case you hadn't seen it before. So if we suppose I put a one and a two here, then this has to be three. Uh, normally, the convention is that um, in a network, if you have a line that has two ends and some other things happening in a network, um, uh, then and you have an index here, then you sum over all choices of index. the products of individual individual tensors. It's probably better to illustrate that general principle with a, with a specific example rather than just a vague diagram. So let me do it again. Um, Suppose I had a diagram um, like this. Um, v, I, W, and we had an edge here like that. Then this would be equal to the sum on I of uh, V, I multiplied by I W a left and a right index on I and W like that. All right, that's an example of what I mean. Maybe one more example would be useful for understanding the convention. The convention is that you are looking at a tensor network which is a graph, maybe let's do it with a knot diagram so we see how it might work there. I may have a knot diagram like this, which is divided into some parts where there are indices. And I'm looking at a situation like this where I have four indices. And then uh, the this upper part here is the diagram for some matrix Mij. And this lower part here is the diagram for some matrix upper KL. And this part in the middle is the diagram for somebody R, 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 R with indices. So then, so then this translates into Mij, R upper Ij, K L quite directly and M upper K L and we take the summation over I and J and K and L like that. And that's another example. So two examples probably suffice here that we sum over all choices of index on an in, on a on a bound line and we take the product of the individual tensor values, okay? If there is an external line like this, W with an I and a J, then this is WIJ and it isn't summed over because no one has told you the other end of the line, okay? So, so that means that categorically speaking, if you had arranged these so that they were morphisms in some category by choosing some categorical direction, then this is composition of those morphisms. And it also means uh, in the sense of putting 
graphs together, that when things are placed next to one another, juxtaposed, that actually corresponds to tensor product. So one can work in this um, category, which is either thought of as graphs with extra structure, or with an arrow, it becomes a, a tensor category, or um, it can just be called tensor networks, which some people do. In any case, now you see what I mean by an identity of this kind. And uh, what will happen here, because this is an epsilon, is if this is a one and that's a two, this has to be a three. And now this could be a one and that could be a two. And now I'm asserting an identity that would have those indices going this way like this. And let's see that this is true. Okay, so um, this is over here, this is epsilon one, two, three, multiplied by epsilon one, three, two, which is equal to one times minus one, which is equal to minus one. Over here, you have delta one, one, and delta two, two. So this is minus one, correct. And this is delta one, two is zero, zero. So this is correct, as you see. And now you see, what I mean by this nice identity, because it's quite clear to you by now that indeed it's correct. If I should switch one and two, then I will have epsilon one, two, three, epsilon one, two, three, plus one, and we will be evaluating one to one, two to two, and picking this up. So this is correct. Uh, and this identity is true, and we could now adopt it uh, for any calculations that we want to do with the epsilon. Pardon me. So now let's go back to talking about vectors a little bit. If I have a vector, Then it has an index, for example, v is equal to v1, v2, and v3. And I will write this as the vector has an index, and the index is i. So it becomes an indexed object as a diagram like that. And then we have the dot product along with the cross product. We have v dot w, and that's equal to this, right? By our definitions, this is equal to the sum on i of v i w i, which is the dot product. So we have the cross product, as we had said before, the cross product of two vectors. Um, is equal to tying in an epsilon like that. And we have the dot pro cross product, right? And now I can show you, before we go on to more topological things, I can show you how you can use this for doing vector calculus. So suppose you looked at V cross W cross Z, the cross product of three vectors. This cross product is not associative, but what does happen? Well, when you do that, you see you have V, you have W, and you have Z, and you have the cross product of W and Z, and then you have the cross product of that with V. And there's our edge to which I can apply the identity. And so by the epsilon identity, this becomes minus something plus something, making sure there's space for it. And then the something is we're going to um, smooth this by the identity. And that becomes this. And the z goes like that. That's doing the first part of the identity. And the second part of the identity um, has a crossover in it so that these two are connected. And we Excuse me, down. can't we get a solution to the Pentagon uh, identity here? 
we're looking at the Lie algebra of SO3. And indeed, uh, you will see instances of a Pentagon identity, but I, I better not try to make it happen right now or I will lose my uh, time, all right? The answer is yes, but I'm not going to try to work anything out, okay? Are you satisfied with that for the time being? When you don't answer, I don't know what to do because I'm not in a room with you and I can't see you. Uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, I, I just uh, would like to ask, just because uh, uh, we start to lose uh, our time when uh, um, uh, with is, the first there, uh, question is, uh, without I, answer. So, uh, is there, I, is there, I just uh, I, uh, laid. Is there a problem? Uh, uh, what is the problem? I think you can go on, no problem. I stop sharing so you can solve whatever problem you're solving. So uh, I'm sorry. Maybe uh, it's better to 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 write uh, just because uh, it's time. So what what what, what is going on? Um, I I I I just a little bit late and. I'm not going to read the chat line. If you want to communicate with me, you have to talk to me. I can't talk and read the chat line at the same time. Okay, I suggest to do the following. I suggest to do the following after uh, so so everyone can write on the chat line and after uh, Lou finishes his talk, uh, we can go to the chat and comment everything. I will uh, read yes, uh, that, all that's that's fine, but but there's no point in my trying to read the chat line while I'm talking. Of course, you're and, right. and my answer to Vasily's question was, Surely there's a relationship with the Pentagon, but we aren't going to try to do that now or else I'll be off track, all right? Okay. So shall I continue? Sure, sure, sure. All right. I apologize for any inconvenience. Okay, so so where did we get to here? We got We were just about to do something interesting. We said that if we took the vector cross product, Excuse me, I want to just get a little space there. We took the vector cross product associated in a certain way. Then it expands according to our identity. We don't have to have indices anymore. We're just using the identity. And then we can write this back out um, from what it says. And it says minus V dot W multiplied by Z plus v dot z multiplied by w and that's the famous identity for the triple vector cross product and you see that it comes out structurally from these diagrammatic relations that's where it comes from entirely um and then and then from there for another further example is if you define vw by definition to be minus v dot w plus v cross w with the understanding that this belongs to r4 this belongs to r3 and that's one extra dimension then this gives you the quaternions And this is associative. And you can check that it's associative by, by these means. So these diagrams, these diagrams for the epsilon underlie uh, the structure of the vector cross product and, and this algebra. 
Okay. Um, so far, so good. Now, let's switch topics a little bit. That would have been one, so this should be two. I didn't label that one one, but if I rewrite the slides, I will. Now we're going to look at the map color, map coloring. And I'm going to use cubic maps. There's our trivalent vertex again. So I'm considering maps that might look like this. Let's see if that's my favorite example. Right now, the problem, the four color problem is to color a plane map with four colors so that if you had a color X and a color Y across a boundary, then the colors are different, right? That's a famous four color problem. And it turns out that it's sufficient. Cubic is sufficient. Cubic is sufficient, that's due to Kemp back in the 19th century. And the reason that cubic is sufficient is probably worth mentioning. Suppose you had a lot of countries that were coming together at a vertex like that. Well, then you can blow up like this. Up, I'm sorry. Let's do it, uh, literally do it. I can take the vertex that I don't like. And I blow it up. And connect it back up like this. And now, if you can color this, then that implies that you can color this. If you can color this, then you can color this by just collapsing however you colored this to a to, to nothing and leaving all these other colors alone. And then it will still be true that you have a colored map over here. So that tells you that it is sufficient to use uh, cubic maps, okay? So we can consider cubic maps. Now, um, uh, of course, there's going to be an epsilon related to the cubic vertex, but let's, um, let's go slowly here. Um, remember, this is an elementary talk. Um, you may know all this already. Um, so we're going to color this. Let's color, it. say, white here and white here. And then uh, let's say blue here and purple here because it has to be different. And then red is needed because this is touching all three. So that's the best you can do in this case. This map requires four colors. And there's an instance of the four color theorem happening that you can do it with four colors. But I wanna talk about uh, reformulations of the four color theorem before we get to the epsilon, which is going to come in. And one way to reformulate the four color theorem, uh, I'm going to need a little room here. So let's move that guy down of the page a little bit there. That's better. And uh, you'll pardon me, I'll 
clean it up. We're going to put a put a product structure on the colors. The colors are equal to the set W R B G R B P. Um, and we're going to think of this as isomorphic to Z2 cross Z2, where W is equal to the identity. Um, R squared equals B squared equals P squared equals W. RB equals P. BP equals R and of course PR equals B. That puts a group structure on the set of four colors. And now we're going to use that group structure by multiplying across regions to get a color on the edge. So W times P is the color of this edge, which is going to be P. And W times R is the color of this edge. We're going to use to color edges. We're going to use the group structure to color the edges of the graph. So uh, P times B is R. P times R is B. P times W is P. W times R is R. B times W is P. B times R is P. And I think we have managed to color every edge. And then you will note a typical edge. has three distinct colors. So this gives rise, as you see, that, and that's going to happen. And if you think about it, you'll see, in fact, we will see one way of going back and forth, that the problem of coloring the map is equivalent to coloring the edges of the map with three colors so that <clears throat> Three distinct colors occur at every cubic vertex. But they are equivalent problems. Uh, oh, and we forgot to color that one. And now, now you can see that we have three distinct colors at every vertex in that gadget. So this is a um, very nice reformulation due to Haywood long ago. But now you see we're getting closer to the epsilon uh, because epsilons are supposed to have three distinct indices in order to be alive. So we're not so far away from the epsilon, are we? Let me copy that. Save this. Get a clean board. And get that back. Oops. Ah. Uh -huh. Have to redraw it a little bit. No, no, it's all right. Okay. Yeah. So now we have this map, which we've colored in two different ways. And um, and I have a number of things that I want to say about this. So one of them is that we've reformulated the problem. So that's an interesting, oops, sorry. That's an interesting problem in its own right, right? That you might consider um, just solving it for some cubic map. Uh, let's do a simple example. Suppose we take this cubic map here um, and and we said all white, I'm interested in coloring it with with three colors on its edges. So I say, all right, let's say red, blue, and purple. And then blue and purple force red here. And purple and red force blue here, and red and blue here force purple here, and we did it, right? So you can play with the coloring problem in that form as well as in this form. Um, now, there are a couple more facts about coloring that are worth thinking about. Um, 
I want you to examine, say, this small example here. Let me get another color. And suppose that I were to take all the purples and, and circle the pairs of edges that correspond to them. Then, of course, I have then created a collection of pairs of vertices so that every pair is disjoint from every other pair, and that's called a perfect matching. And we could do that in our other example as well. We could take the purples and uh, join them together like that. And we'll have a perfect matching for this other graph. Where's another purple? Here. Right. There's a nice, per nice perfect matching for this graph. Now, I want you to notice something which is easy to see on either of these. Take a walk on the vertices that are not in the perfect match on the edges that are not in the perfect matching red blue red blue even path and of course it's an even path from the coloring because you have to alternate between red and blue as you take such a path you're avoiding purple you're taking a, a path that's not purple you go red blue red blue and it's even so this is an even perfect matching and so is this one you see, you go red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. Of course, it might have more than one component uh, because we're going to remove the purple edges. In general, you'll have a bunch of cycles, but they'll all be even. And so, um, and so the four color theorem is equivalent to saying that you can three color the edges and it's equivalent to saying that the cubic graph has an even perfect matching. So that's very nice. And another way to think about the problem, I, it's a background to it that's worth understanding. Sorry, what is even perfect matching? What is even? that there are an even number of edges in the path in all the cycles that are in the complement. Mm -hmm. Every Thank you. every cycle in G minus the set of PM edges has an even number of edges. So you might you might walk up to some go back to our example here. This was our example. You might have walked up to this and said, I think I'll write down a perfect matching for this. Um and I had one in mind. Uh, yeah. Uh, I wanted to show you one that was not going to work. Um, um, there we go. Mm -hmm. So I might, I might have chosen a different one like that. This and this and this let's see what happened there that that is a different one all right here's a perfect matching a different perfect matching now if you just look at it before doing anything else to it you count uh, one two three and one two three so this is an odd perfect matching and this odd perfect matching won't supply you with the coloring because you could color all three of these purple like we did, but then you wouldn't be able to alternate in red and blue on the other cycle, so it won't work. But if you're searching for colorings, you can start by choosing a perfect matching, and they do exist. Perfect matchings 
exists for cubic graphs. This is a result partly due to Peterson originally in, a, in some planar cases and taught in general and is a not not too hard a, a theorem in graph theory. So it is uh, requires proof. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, um, uh, isn't uh, this fact is obvious um, just uh, because uh, uh, if you uh, uh, remove um, if you um, if you will uh, ch change the um, um, uh, if you uh, will uh, uh, I mean uh, uh, we can uh, uh, change the uh, triple um, uh, uh, um, the triple fragments to the uh, um, I mean we can uh, I, um, we can uh, uh, change uh, uh -oh. our edges to the uh, uh, cross um, cr crossing fragments and so um, I, 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 I mean uh, we can uh, um, do some uh, 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 no, let, let me say what's obvious and what isn't I think you and I agree but maybe it's a little hard to communicate it's this is not obvious this is a theorem that perfect matchings exist for cubic graphs it's not hard to prove but it's not obvious uh, I, I, I mean uh, we can uh, uh, I can show that uh, this is almost the same. That uh, uh, after some uh, uh, transformations, uh, uh, I uh, we can uh, try to solve uh, the uh, uh, two coloring problem to the uh, bipartite graph. I mean, uh, look, um, it takes you a long time to try to get to the point. I understand that, and we have a limited amount of time. Uh, uh, let me I'm just sure. uh, please allow me to just state what is obvious and what isn't. This requires proof. If you find an odd perfect matching, you can search to turn it into an even perfect matching. That's very interesting. And if you were to prove, you could try to prove the four color theorem by showing that you could convert odd perfect matchings to even perfect matchings. It's a way of thinking. If you have a coloring, it gives you an even perfect match. That is obvious. And if you have an even perfect matching, you can obtain a coloring. That is obvious. So this part from here to here is obvious. Okay. Uh May I ask a question? If I have a proof for the uh, ex a very simple proof for the existent, uh, proof for the of existence, what? what? What are you going to prove? Uh, that uh, uh, there exists a perfect matching for the cubic graph. You need an even perfect matching. To I mean, even. Uh, I mean. That's the hard part, to prove that there's an even perfect matching. Perfect matchings exist. To prove that there are even perfect matchings is hard. I, I mean, even for... Uh, uh, well, I, I suggest I suggest you to write it as an email, uh, and we will forward it to Professor That's Conner. right. No, Please no. I, I, yeah. Okay, I, okay. I, I, I just ask. So, thank you. All right. So... Now comes the next part. Um, uh, I've given you this background, but now I want to show you a very nice way to handle this. Well, let me see. I guess I should just make a new drawing. And this way will lead us 
to Penrose, as you'll see. But we need to do a little work. So um, let me go back to our example. And the edge coloring that we had for our example, which was blue, purple, red, red, um, oh, I'm sorry, I should have copied it from the other one, blue, red, red, purple, blue, purple, there it is. Uh, yeah, okay. So three different colors at every vertex like that. But now I'm going to make a construction. I'm going to let red be a solid line. I'm going to let blue be a dotted line if I should happen to um, um, be drawing in black and white for some reason. And uh, then I'm going to have purple be the combination of red and blue. So this is red, this is blue, and this is purple. And, and by that means, I'm going to have a two color circuit drawn in relation to the coloring. And let's do it here and you'll see what I mean. I'm going to, on, on the red, I'm going to draw red. When I get to purple, since purple is red and blue, I continue in red and I get alternating red-blue circuits like this. I get one in this case. And then I'm going to get blue circuits in the same way, and I'll draw them in constant color rather than dotted, but if I should change to black and white, they'll become, so here's blue, but blue is, uh, oops, blue is part of purple. So it continues on purple. I'm really drawing a blue, purple alternating circuit, and this continues on blue here, and then on purple, and then on blue, and then over here and comes back around. And uh, we have um, uh, we have done it. All right, so you can see the structure of this. If I were to draw it separately, there's the blue and the red. Um, let's see, the red. Um, sorry, I should have drawn the red first. It makes it easier. Here's the red. And there's the blue. So now you're looking at the coloring from a different point of view. You're seeing it as an interaction of red and blue circuits, where, of course, blue circuits never touch blue circuits. Red circuits touch blue circuits, and red circuits don't touch red circuits. And the circuits interact with one another in the following way, that if you had red interacting with blue, then it will share a bit of edge and continue on, or it will share a bit of edge and go back off on the same side. These are the two forms of interaction. And that is the structure of a coloring, and I'll call this a formation.
Uh, so a formation is an interaction of red and blue circuits that do this. And you see from this that we have entered a different domain of thinking about the structure of the colorings because now I could do the following. I could say, well, I'm interested in making a coloring, so I'll draw some circuits. into colors. I can draw to my heart's content in this fashion. And then uh, after I finished making such a drawing, I see that in fact, what I have done is I have colored an underlying map. Let's do it here so we see what we did. So this is a coloring of that graph. Uh, so instead of taking a graph and asking how can I color it, I can draw infinitely many colorings and consider what graphs I get. And then the four color theorem says that making formations produces all one connected cubic plane graphs. What's this one connected bit? This is not one connected. One connected, I won't write down the definition because I'm, I'm giving you an example in the complement of the definition. Um, uh, uh, one connected means that there are no edges which if you remove them will disconnect the graph. And this of course is uncolorable. You can't color that. So the four color theorem says that one connected cubic plane graphs can be colored. So it says that if you choose some cubic plane graph, there exists a coloring. But here we're in the complement of, uh, of that way of thinking. We, have, uh, we can produce infinitely many colored objects, and every one of them is the coloring of some graph. And then it could be that there would be a beautiful argument that would show that you can make all graphs this way. But any arguments that I know run into problems with mathematical induction or other complexities and become quite intricate to try to prove it. But it's, uh, on the other hand, it shows you that the evidence for the four color theorem is enormous because you can make so many of these. And how could it be that one of them would, that no graph would be uh, admitted to their company? But now we're going to use this. So now let me go to part three. Uh, may I ask, before you uh, erase yeah, this yeah, yeah, so of picture, I'll before you erase this? I'll keep the slide there. All right. Uh, may I ask a question? One sure. little question. Uh, so, uh, uh, is it uh, true that uh, uh, instead uh, of a cubic uh, graphs, we can consider the, the Hort diagrams? I mean, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, chord diagrams is uh, the... Oh, chord diagrams. These remind yes. you of chord diagrams. Yeah, they do remind one of chord diagrams in various ways. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, this is a... Uh, if you have the uh, uh, one connected uh, cubic uh, graph, uh, 
So uh, this is uh, all, all this you, you can consider uh, uh, the corresponding core diagrams and the, uh, this is uh, and uh, uh, it's not the unique way to the uh, so uh, no, no, I agree with you that um, uh, the apparatus, you see, I'm starting in the completely elementary place of the graph theory and the coloring problem and certain things like the epsilon, uh, but but uh, chord diagrams are a natural thing to consider, whether you're in knot theory or whether you're looking at the combinatorics in a more abstract way. And and as you know, in, in our research, we've gone back and forth between using things like chord diagrams in topology or using them to think about the graphs. Yeah. So um, uh, why uh, I uh, t tell about chord diagrams? Because when you have chord diagrams, you can consider the bipartite graph corresponding bipart bipart bi bipartite graph. I mean. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. it right. means that uh, if you have the cubic, one connected cubic graph, you can always consider the corresponding bipartite graph. Well, in other words, you can choose a perfect matching. Yes, exactly. Uh, sure, you can choose a perfect matching, and it may not be even, and then you're facing the problem of getting an even perfect matching for the sake of the coloring problem. When you are looking at this structure, you know that you have an even perfect matching because we could mark all the purple edges. Let's mark them. Mark, mark, uh, mark, uh, this one marked, that one marked, uh, these two over here are marked. And this one is marked. So the edges that I have marked are the perfect matching edges. Then you get your bipartite situation. And, and then uh, you can verify that this is an even perfect matching by taking a walk. For example, I walk, start walking here and I go, oh, oh one more here, right. Um, and I take a walk, one, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, what I, I missed somebody. I don't know, twelve, thirteen, but somebody's missing. No, thirteen, fourteen. Yeah, and I, and I came around in fourteen edges, right? And you can check. It's perfect. It it is an even perfect matching. But of course, we knew that because it alternates in red and blue on the non-purple edges. But in the coloring problem, you have this hard question of finding even perfect matching. And, and uh, the, the point I'm making is that every coloring is a formation and we're going to use that. So shall I go on? Yeah, all right. Um, I believe I want to save that now because I changed it a little bit. So we'll go one more page. I thought I'd give you the notes afterwards, maybe modified a little bit with some commentary. So, okay. So now comes part three, which is Penrose formula. So what did Penrose do? Penrose said, associate to every cubic vertex with labels on it, A, B, C, and D, A, B, and C, and those things belong to one, two, three, which for our purposes, we can think of as red, blue, and purple, all right? associate to this the square root of minus one epsilon a b c and that's important that is 
the clockwise turn around ABC. So that um, if you, so this is, it's the cyclic order ABC like that. So, so this is epsilon one, two, three times I, and this is epsilon one, two, three times I. You only need the cyclic order, one, two, three. Okay, you're gonna associate this, and then you're going to take bracket G to be equal to the contracted tensor value. So let's see what we mean by that. I take a graph, I label its edges. And then I'm going to associate to this, those tensors. So that means that I have, I have I epsilon ABC. And over here I have I epsilon ACB, right? And then I have I epsilon ABC, I epsilon ACB, and I'm going to summate, I'm going to take the summation over A, B, and C. And I'm going to call that bracket G, okay? So just like we did earlier when we talked about the tensor networks and the epsilon, this is what we're going to do. And then Penrose is claiming, Penrose theorem, is that bracket G is equal to the number of three colorings of G when G is embedded in the plane. Believe it? Let's prove it, okay? But is it clear what we're saying? Now, now think about it a little bit and you'll see that we've almost proved it, right? Because in order for the index choice to uh, survive, you have to have three distinct indices at every node. So we're actually summing over all the colorings and only the colorings. So the coloring of edges or coloring of faces? Coloring of edges. Mm -hmm. We're edge uh. coloring. We're counting edge coloring, three colorings, edge colorings. Uh, um, may I ask, uh, this G bracket, is uh, this formula, it looks... Uh, uh, what is, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the statement of the theorem, uh, it's remind uh, us uh, uh, the enumerative invariance uh, of the other objects. For example, uh, for example, uh, um, can we uh, somehow uh, um, uh, relate uh, and think about, I mean, think, uh, that three colorings, uh, it, um, uh, it, 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 it's uh, somehow, uh, um, I, uh, I mean, uh, we can consider the other objects, for example, the number of... Uh, um, of uh, oh, you're asking what else might it enumerate? Uh, I mean... Uh, Aren't you asking that? Uh, oh, what is your name, by the way? So I don't keep calling you you. <laughs> what is your name? Uh, uh, my name is Irina. And, Irina, and, uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, Irina, uh, you're 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 asking Irina, is that right? Irina. Irina. Oh. Yeah, yeah. You're, so, you're asking. You're asking what else might it enumerate? What we I written... mean, for example, uh, you know, uh, Gromov Witten invariance. 
Yes. Grom, you know, invariance of Grom of Witten. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's um, uh, uh, one of the uh, way of things, uh, and uh, about it, uh, it's uh, uh, this. Uh, it can be considered as a combinatorical question about. Well, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're, we're, well, of course, we're aware. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons I'm talking about this very elementary thing is because if we were to continue, and we won't be continuing today into things that, for example, Vasily and I have been interested in, where we, uh, we may consider things that are quite similar to this, uh, such as Cooperberg's not invariance. And then we're enumerating something else. We're enumerating something topological. We don't. We we ask that we can ask the question: What are we enumerating? And then we're also interested in how it relates to combinatorics by virtual knot theory and so on. So, um, so even in this graph theoretic situation, you could ask, well, what else might this do? But what we're looking at right now is what it does in relation to the coloring problem. Is it all right? Shall I go on? Mm, yes, sure. But uh, the last thing, uh, you know, uh, that uh, tropical curves, it's uh, some, uh, it looks, uh, um, I mean, in the, uh, I, I mean, um, uh, the count, the number uh, of, uh, I mean, it's, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, forget about topological part of uh, uh, our, uh, I mean, uh, um, okay, okay, uh, I'm sorry, uh, okay, I understand. I apologize. Uh, so, yeah, okay. So, let me uh, please allow me to go on uh, here. Um, now, now we want to understand why Penrose's theorem is true, and we're right next to the proof, so it won't be hard to give the proof now. Um, what is it we want to show? We want to show that every non zero term in this Penrose sum is a one. That's what we have to show. So it adds up and gives you the number of colorings. Now you have i to some power. Every one of the vertices contributes either plus i or minus i. And so you, um, you need to see that you're going to get plus one in the end. And that isn't quite obvious here. It's some kind of parity fact. So let's look at an example and see what's going on. In fact, let's look at this example just for a moment. Um, if we took this very example and we colored it um, one, two, three, then you see I have one, two, three, and I have I. And I have one, three, two, and I have minus I. And for that coloring, I get the product of I and minus I. I times minus I equal to one. And that's what I wanted, right? That's what I wanted. So you see it's working. But why is it working? So let's go to the next slide and see why. Well, you will recall that We said that colorings were the same as formations. So let's examine how things are going to behave when you have a formation. Let's just choose one, like this one. Maybe I'll put another one over here. And now let's write down the eyes the Penrose eyes that come from this, because this is going to be one of the terms in Penrose's sum. And, um, and our, our story is um, that cyclically red, blue, purple is I and blue, red, purple 
Excuse me. Is minus sign. So we can write down what happens everywhere. So this is red, blue, purple, and that's an I. And this is red, purple, blue, and that's a minus I. And this is uh, red, um, uh, um, this is a minus I, and this is a plus I. And this one is uh, red, blue, purple is an I. And this is red, blue, purple, and that's another I. And this is, um, Red, purple, blue is a minus I, and this is red, blue, purple is a plus I. And this is, uh, you. I think you're beginning to get it, right? Red, blue, purple, this is an I, and this is red, purple, blue, this is a minus I. And now you see what happened, because all of our interactions are pairs. You go along and then you share in purple and then you come off. And if you come off on the same side, you get I times minus I is equal to plus one. So you don't have to, you can ignore when it comes off on the same side, but when it crosses, then you get a minus I and a plus I and you, as a result, get a minus one. So that says that each Penrose term is equal to minus one to the number of crossings of red and blue curves. And we are in the plane and so the Jordan curve theorem implies that, let's just call this minus one to the number of crossings to shorten it, implies that minus one to the number of crossings is equal to plus one. And therefore, bracket G is equal to the number of colorings. That's my proof of Penrose's formula. Question? Uh, yes. We're not done with so, the lecture. We're done with the proof, okay? Yeah. So, uh, I'm a little bit not okay with uh, the structure of formation. So, uh, the one step before, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so we have, yeah, we have this uh, uh, three, uh, uh, we have this cubic, uh, we have our cubic graph as the, as the first uh, uh, object that we consider and after we consider the corresponding formation. Yes. Yes, every coloration. In this case, the graph uh, under consideration is this little graph here. I'll draw a picture of it just so we have the graph um, available for our uh, um, view. All right, that's, that's the graph G that is being considered in this, in this example. And that graph G has various colorings of which I have drawn one. Right, this is a coloring of G. And colorings can always be configured as formations by, by factoring the purples into blue and red. And then you see an interaction of colored curves. And the interactions of colored curves consist in two curves coming together and touching um, or two curves crossing. And we find that there is no contribution to the Penrose product from each touching. So we only are looking at the way some curves are crossing one another. Uh, so is uh, the uh, interesting uh, uh, 
think that uh, uh, if there, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, double crossings, uh, I mean, uh, 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 is this graph G? Uh, there are many, many different colorings of G. And for each coloring, there is a curve configuration, a formation. And for each such curve configuration, there are some, there is a parity consideration in terms of the curves crossing one another. So the crossing configuration that we, um, that we came to in this case was, I'll draw it up here in small, there were two red curves and there were two blue curves and we don't care about these, they don't cross, I could pull them apart. But this crossed through and then it crossed back through. And this one, I don't care about them, they came apart. So this is, this little pattern here is the parity consideration that tells me that I'm going to get plus one. I'm going to get I and I. I'm going to get minus one and minus one. Those are the two minus ones. Here's the other minus one. I didn't label it. Um, let's label it. Um, uh, so, uh, while you were thinking, if you can, if you consider the peak a minus one. So the Penrose contribution here was plus plus plus. Minus, minus, minus one squared, plus one. Uh, I apologize. I think each of us has uh, many questions. For example, I left lots of questions on the chat line. And I think it would be better if we organize a sort of email discussion afterwards. Well, that the, we that's fine. Did. That's fine. Let me, let me go on uh, a bit so that you see how this is related to some topology. Um, I assume we can go on for another 20 minutes, yeah? Can we? Can, yeah, yes. Okay, fine. Sure. So we've proved the Penrose theorem. Um, I think it's good though, if you have direct questions about the proof to slow down and ask it. Questions about relationship are harder, general relationship. But the proof is very simple as you see. It's just a matter of recognizing that each coloration uh, uh, pairs up the eyes and the minus eyes when, it's, when they don't cross, where they do not cross, and where they do cross, you get a minus one. Okay, now. But they can cross uh, with uh, with the uh, two uh, different uh, ways. I mean, uh, when yeah, we have yeah, let's crossing... look at let's look at how things can cross. Um, I'll I'll get a I'll get us some blackboard space. There, good. Now, how can things cross? You have an edge. Another another color, the blue, is coming up and it can go and share a bit and come back. That's one way, right? Another way is that the blue can come in and it can go to the right and then it can cross. And yet another way is that the blue can come in and it can go to the left and it can cross. Now I want you to examine what the I and minus I's are. Red, blue, purple, that's an I. Blue, red, purple, that's a minus I. Red, blue, purple, that's an I. Red, blue, purple, that's an I. Red, blue, purple, that's an I. And uh, I'm sorry, that's a minus I. And red, purple, blue, that's a minus I. So that in these two cases, we have I squared equals minus one, and we have minus I squared equals minus one. And here we have I times minus I equals one. So in this case, we can just as well generically pull the two curves apart. It won't make a difference in the Penrose count. And in these two cases, we can say that the two curves are crossing.
And so the underlying topology of the situation is that we have a collection of blue curves and a collection of red curves, and we're counting how many times a blue curve will cross a red curve. And that's even because we're in the plane. Is it clear? Yes. All right, but now let's go on. Well, that, that proves Penrose's formula is true, but Penrose, Penrose said more, okay? Um, what more did he say? He said, he said, look, he said, look here. You're going to get a nice identity like this, a skein identity, you might say. And of course, if you had a uh, just a loop in this calculation, you'd get three. Now, why did it switch? Because you see, what we did was we we're taking this to be equal to the square root of minus one epsilon, right? And we know our identity then will become whatever we get when we put square root of minus one in there, right? And that will be equal to this will be equal to minus the usual and so with this you're going to have the identity with a flipped sign we had it sign here sign there but now it'll be the other way around and that's what happens here okay and that uh, aesthetically that's perhaps better because you would like the minus to correspond to the crossing and then dot. Okay. So this is Penrose recursion. And and that lets you calculate the, just like we were doing vector cross products without ever having to think about the tensors, we can calculate the number of colorings of a, of a cubic map in the plane by just doing this skein relation over and over again. Excuse me a moment, I'll be right back. Yeah, so, so for, let's do a quick example of this. We're certainly not going to do a lot of calculations here, but this lets you calculate independently of everything else. So for example, if we had this guy and we wanted to do the skein calculation, then we would turn it into this minus this. And this is going to be equal to three squared minus three, which is equal to six. And that's correct. Three colors here, two there, one there. Okay. Um, and so, and so the the whole mystery of the four color theorem then is is translated into the mystery of why should it be that this will always be non-zero when you're working with a planar graph, um, and now you see that it's beginning to look similar to various kinds of skein theories that we're familiar with from topology. Okay, so that's one comment. Um, um, question on this. Okay. Um, next what comment. What is usual? I'm listening. What means usual? I didn't catch the question. What, was what meaning of the term usual? What is the meaning of? Usual. Usual. Oh, I'm sorry, think about it. Um, we have, um, we're, I'm multiplying the epsilon by the square root of minus one. We, the usual, The 
The usual was epsilon. That's what we started with. Mm. If I multiply the usual by square root of minus one, then this formula, the, oh, this is the new formula, and the old formula was a reversal of sign. Right? You multiply by I and I. If you put an I here and you put an I here, you multiply this by minus one and this formula flips. The node for us in doing Penrose is the square root of minus one times the original epsilon. Is that clear? No? Uh, yes. Uh, it's, it's, okay. Okay. I think it would be nice if Lou uh, makes some very final remarks, and after that we organize a, a, an email conversation and uh, discuss. Well, as I said, we can we could have another session where we talk about uh, questions about this, or we can do it by email. But but let me continue talking about uh, about what I wanted to tell you. All right. So there are two directions. It's yeah. And the, the, the square uh, square uh, bracket means uh, the uh, number of uh, three coloring uh, of the corresponding uh, cubic graphs that we uh, obtain uh, from the uh, from uh, after. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, first we consider the uh, uh, cubic. Yeah, yes, you're correct. You're correct. We proved that there we there are two things. We already understand that this identity is true. We've proved this identity. That's what I'm saying. We know that the bracket G is equal to the number of three colorings, and we have already proved this identity because this is the epsilon. In the earlier part of the talk, we had an identity about two epsilons tied together. That implies this identity. So that put it, so we know it counts the number of colorings. And we know it satisfies this identity. Are you okay with that now? Um, you can try it out. Um, do it on another example, right? Let's. The, 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 I, I don't want to do it on a complicated example, but consider this example um, and ask yourself how many colorings there will be, but we're going to do it by Penrose method. So if I do it by Penrose method, then I'm going to use this edge. Now this has zero coloring, so I can forget about it and keep on going. There aren't any coloring. Oh, what about Penrose though? What will Penrose give you for that? Let's check that one. Everything is right. If you had this, then Penrose says that this will give you this minus this, which is three minus three. is zero. And of course, that has no colorings. So um, now this one, we'll have to expand on this one. So goes over the top and goes underneath here. That's the smoothing. And then minus, oh, but it's minus that and plus this. And then we'll have a crossover there. And this will come underneath in the lounge like that. And that'll be 
that's our answer. Um, um, have I made a mistake? Surely I've made a mistake. Let's see. Uh, is this what, what, what mistake? Question? You have a nice problem to solve with me. Well, I made a mistake in in this calculation. Can you find my mistake? I can never find my mistakes except by redoing the calculation. So I shall redo it, and I'll be a little more careful about handling my diagrams so that we don't it would be make nice if you fin if you finish soon and then uh, and then we organize a problem session and mm -hmm. question session and whatever else you wish um yeah um i still haven't quite uh i hope you'll just be patient with me because i decided to give a blackboard talk and that means going slowly through various bits and pieces of things So if we do this calculation, I'll stop uh, after I do this calculation and talk generally for a few minutes and then we'll be done, okay? Uh, me, uh, I, I... Uh, I'm doing a calculation, right? Uh, this is, you have to focus. All we're doing here is illustrating the Penrose formula. We're gonna do a calculation. This will go to smoothing this, that's the one thing. We're going to use this edge. Just a question, Alexa. Yeah. Or putting in a crossing there. And this one will be minus, and this one will be zero. Um, can this calculation, can we can obtain it from the uh, left? Uh... I wish, I am, I'm requesting that you simply follow the calculation. That's all we're doing right now. Well... All we're doing is this calculation. That's all we're doing. It's going to be minus one and plus the other. And we're going to be modifying this one now, which means that we are going to take this and we're going to take this. And we're going to connect this. And we're going to cross connect this. All right, and now what happened? We got minus three from this one and we got plus two curves, nine, and we end up with six. And indeed, this also has six colors. But I just wanted to illustrate for you the issues in doing the calculation and that um, and that you don't, when you do this, you're not thinking about colorings at all. You're just going through the uh, skein theory of it as it were, or the state sum skein theory of it. And the four color theorem tells you that when you have a plane graph, it will always be non-zero. I need to show you one more phenomenon and then I will stop, although we can do a lot more. Um, uh, so, is, is this true that obtaining a uh, edge uh, doesn't change the uh, colorings? I mean, we had the uh, 
grave where we had the, the one edge in, uh, inside. Uh, I mean, the picture, the, the left picture. And the, the, uh, You mean the picture that I had just a moment ago, this one? Yes, this one is uh, the... Uh, this this uh, happens to have six colorings, and it didn't change the number of colorings when I did that. But in general, of course, as the graph gets more complicated, it has more colorings. I apologize, but some uh, some regulations uh, f force us to finish. Yeah, yeah, so I understand that, and I'm going to finish now. If you'll allow me to finish. So, there are a number of things that I wanted to continue with. One, bracket G is not counting colors if G is not planar. Two, that can be corrected. It's an interesting story to modify Penrose's formula so that it counts for any cur any map whatsoever. So you would like to be able to draw a non-planar graph like this one and use a Penrose formula and find out that it has 12 colorings. But the formula that I gave you will not work. You have to modify it in relation to the fact that it's not planar and it has an immersion process that can be corrected. You can ask the question, what about um, something like changing the loop value? And what about having a more complicated skein relation like this one? Right? What about generalizing? The answer, and it's almost surprising, is it corresponds to the bracket polynomial for virtual diagrams. And so one ends up mapping graphs to virtual knot theory and getting correspondences, but it's only defined, it depends on the choice of perfect matching. So it's no longer independent of how you calculate unless you choose a perfect matching. But if you choose a perfect matching, a perfect matching edge, then you can take this over and rewrite it in virtual language like this. And then you end up in virtual knob theory modulo simple flight if we're doing unoriented diagrams because you need to put this on either side. Um, and then everything gets translated. So this is the translation. Um, and then you uh, have this conduit between graph theory different conduit from some of the usual ones between graph theory and virtual knot theory. And there are many interesting things to say about that. And that's where this begins to interact with the topology in various ways. So that's the end of the talk. Look, a really a great talk, wonderful talk. We would be very happy if you can give yet another talk and we will organize whatever session, whatever discussion, everything as you wish. And, uh, sure. Really now, I, I'm 
I have to say, I'm, I'm glad you had so many questions. I thought that by slowing it down and making it a Blackboard talk, that might help yeah, create yeah. more questions. We will because be when, we, when we give slideshows, uh, it goes too fast. And when we talk more slowly, many questions can arise. Thank uh, you. Very I'm much. sorry. Uh, I have the last question. What if we uh, consider the framing uh, uh, of, uh, I mean, uh, look at the left picture, and uh, then uh, when we change, uh, look at this transformation, uh, we, we can uh, imagine the sign. I mean, uh, this if we uh, will give the sign to the left uh, part, for example, plus one or minus one, so it uh, can... Um, uh, definitely uh, resolve the right side. I mean, without... Oh, so you're talking about this sign? Are you talking about... You're talking about this sign here? Irina, uh, is this the sign you're talking about? Uh, I, uh, I'm not uh, talk, uh, talking about uh, the uh, correct uh, uh, the uh, way of how we will give the sign to the, I mean, uh, possibly yes, but uh, uh, I mean just uh, that uh, when the, I mean your uh, your uh, your picture. Uh, well, I, I your, apologize. Uh, we have to stop for now, and we will organize all possible discussions as with as many questions <laughs> as possible. Thank you very much. I'm I'm very sorry. Thank okay. you. Thank but, you very no, much. It, um, just a minute. Let me stop sharing here. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. It was really a great talk. Yeah. Really. We, we really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.